I am an imbecile. So yesterday when I recorded the footage in my fucking Ricky cosplay, I didn't check that it was recording my voice and it wasn't. And that was yesterday, okay? And I'm not putting that shit on again. So I'm sorry for that. I hope I won't repeat that same mistake again. Furry, trust me, I tried to think of a less cringy term, but I, I just couldn't find one. And that is because, as you will see, what I consider within the term of furry in the Dotaverse is a large variety of things from the earth sign to satyrs and wolves. So let's start off this video by defining what is a furry and what isn't, and then go through them one by one. Simply put, all humanoids with non-human mammalian features and intelligence high enough for language is what I consider a furry. This include things like satyrs and tusks people, but excludes things like centaurs. Centaurs are weird because they aren't 50-50 animal and human, or even 75-25. They are like 75% human and 75% horse, which adds up to 150%. In the Dotaverse, there is also a lot of different kinds of things following the same basics as the centaurs, like the Magnosteri, the Prowlers, Underlord, and even more magical and otherworldly heroes like Enchantress, Leshrac, and Odie. For that reason, in my definition, furries do not include centaurs. They include all other mammals though. Other animal-y kinds that aren't furries is snaky and fishy people like the Maranths, and arthropods like Brood and Nyx Assassin. Skyrus people, kobolds, the Ravenhooks, and Smeevils are also not furries. So when comparing them to humans, Keenfolk, Oglody, and Trolls, their behavior, cultures, physical ability, and intelligence is very similar to humans. There is nothing that suggests that furries in general are dumber, smarter, stronger, or weaker than humans, but just that whatever animal they are based on will sway them to either direction. Ursa, for example, gets bare strength, while Bounty Hunter gets cat-like agility. Interestingly, none are enteros. Just to clarify, furry in the Dotaverse is a term I have made for the sake of organizing the kind of playable characters we have. It doesn't actually mean anything in the games and isn't mentioned anywhere in the lore. It's simply because they all have in common that they are anthropomorphic mammals. Within the umbrella term, there is a large variety of kinds which we are now going to talk about. From the European and North American parts of the world, we have Brizzleback, Meepo, Pangolier, Tusk, Rix, and Ursa. From the Asian part of the Dota world, we have Brewmaster, Monkey King, Phantom Lancer, Ricky, and Bounty Hunter. Note that this is based on the personality and lore of the hero, and not necessarily where the animal in our real life world is found. First up, we have the bear kinds, the Tusk polar bears from the north, the red panda bears in the east, and the brown or grizzly bears from the west. Ice Rack, Cobalt, Azura, and basically everything north of the barrier is inhabited by Tusks people. They seem to be anthropomorphic polar bears with walrus tusks, so let's just call them walrus bears. Notable characters that are walrus bears are the characters Crystal Maiden is helping in her comic, the NPCs from Siltbreaker Act 2, Joel from Underlords, Ezir who is one of Tusks ancestors, and Tusk himself. Tusk is from Cobalt, which is near Ice Rack. He knows Crystal Maiden, and they may have grown up together. He doesn't like to travel southwards and prefers the north. Yet, after a particularly violent fight that destroyed a tavern, the barkeep told Tusk that if he could win the biggest fight he could find, the next round would be on the house. There is a mandala effect among a lot of lore nerds, including myself, where they think that the fight in the wolf dance tavern is the same one as the one where Tusk wins over Brizzleback, but that's not true. The fight between them was before the one that sent Tusk out to the Battle of the Ancients. So Brewmaster is half panda furry and half celestial. Though he is a red panda, I kind of imagine his people like Poe's family and Kung Fu Panda. A bunch of Chinese old bears living in peace and like balance and chi and stuff. <laughs> the Celestials are basically a whole species of godlike entities that control elements. The spirits that became Ember, Earth and Storm Spirit were Celestials for example. And Void Spirits of course. But other than being a half god, Brewmaster is a red panda from the Wailing Mountains. His people believe that to get truly in touch with your spirit and to get enlightened, you must drink. And the highest form of art to them is the art to brew and consume alcohol and fight while drunk. Brewmaster is a title you must earn through challenging the current Brewmaster to a drunken battle. Manjinx, which is our Dota hero's name, fought the Brewmaster for nine days and nine nights while simultaneously chugging down before he finally won and was appointed the new Brewmaster. He thinks that if, while drunk and in touch with his spirit, he thinks the single right thought, the schism will be undone and the physical and spiritual plane will once again be united. The Ursine are much more as one with nature than the other bear furries, especially Ulfsar the Ursa warrior who despises science, technology and the keenfolk. 
He is the strongest member of his tribe of Ursine and is dependable both physically and when it comes to loyalty. When the mothers and cubs of the tribe hibernate during the winters, the male Ursine protect them. They venture out making sure no harm can come near the nests, often proactively planning to take down growing threats before they can get out of control. In Artifact, he is helping out the Vools against the Bronze Legion, which we will come back to. Depending on how flexible your faith and imagination is, the Hellbears may also be Ursine, or at least used to be. There's a theory that the cubs Ursa is always protecting used to get caught by the King of Slums men and then turned into slave soldiers using sorcery. Then, as we see in Artifact, they escaped when Quirthius was killed and his animals freed and can now be found in the Hellbear camps in Dota 2. They can't find their way back to their Ursine mothers though, because the magic in the Cruel King removed their sense of smell and altered their looks too much. Sir Action Sacks has a Lorgasm episode where he talks more in detail about this, but that's the basics of the story. Though, bear in mind, it is a little bit far-fetched and it's very likely that Hellbears are their own kind of animal in Dota 2. Regardless, they aren't intelligent enough and human enough to be considered furries, whether they used to be Ursine cubs or not. They aren't capable of speaking in artifact voice lines like the satyrs can, but it's still a fun theory. So Monkey King is actually a character I was considering not including, because he's based on the real-life Chinese folklore legend and he's immortal and super powerful, way beyond furries like for example Tusk. But it's possible that he was a regular little monkey furry once, before ripping out his page in the Book of the Dead. And also, I remember there's another monkey furry in the Dota universe, in the Legion Commander comic, Tip of the Spear. Or at least to me he looks like one. So whether or not Monkey King should be included in this video or not, at least there is some evidence that there is a monkey people. But anyways, just for fun, let's go through his lore. So basically, in his Arcana and his second comic, we learn that in the past, first of all, he was hatched from a magic stone and not born though the lore text itself questions whether or not this is true. Secondly, we learn that he has done three main things before ending up under a mountain in his Dota 2 bio. He got the MKB through Tidehunter, and then, according to Alexa, he also escaped from Dark Reef Prison. But people argue whether or not we can trust her word. Then, he went to the Narrow Maze and sparred with Razor, and ultimately ended up cheating death by tearing out a page in the Book of the Dead, becoming immortal. Lastly, he was imprisoned by the four spirit brothers for his misbehavior, punished by Ember Spirit in specific to be locked in the eternal furnace. He burned there for 49 days, unable to die. But instead of being cleansed of mischief and unnatural longevity, he instead meditated and ascended, even stronger than before. Then, the Elder Gods imprisoned him under a mountain, where he lay for 500 years with only his head poking out. Eventually, he was able to make a deal with the Old Gods in a chance at redemption. He would protect an acolyte transporting a relic and guide him safely home to his temple. He actually completed a mission and was forgiven. But then, with blank new pages, he figured out he just couldn't help himself. <laughs> Offending Gods never gets old. Ricky was born the turd in the middle, just like me. His people were likely satyrs, a race of furries we don't see much in Dota 2. We see them in a medium and large creep camp, but no other hero. In Artifact though, a bunch of characters fit the criteria. The criteria is horns, a goat-like face, and goat legs. Jolixia is a fawn, which is basically, at least in the Dotaverse, a satyr just less goaty. IRL, there is no hard distinction between fawn and satyr. But in Artifact, there's also Trivian, the satyr duelist, who is an even gallant, Allegra, the satyr magician, and Jama, the cursed satyr. Part of the Bronze Legion are satyrs, for example, Pololo, the Legion standard bearer, an unknown deserter who is a member of the mercenary exiles, and Belisano, who might be romantically involved with the Legion commander. But let's focus on the most important satyr, my boy, Ricky. He was born in the great noble Talin dynasty, where his older brother was the heir to the throne and his younger brother was the cute little baby. So there was not much spare attention left for poor little Ricky, causing him to become quite literally invisible. But this stealth would prove itself a blessing, because one night his people and family were all slaughtered, except the agile middle child. He managed to escape using surprising stabs from the shadows and silencing smoke, but he was left without a family and only a burning desire for revenge. He has since joined the Jasper Circle, a company that, among other things, lets you hire assassins. The Vools are most known for being a creep camp in Dota 2 and for their beta uprising in Artifact. They are a dog or wolf-like people, and their most notable character is Rix. They inhabit the forests around Stonehall, such as Roseleaf and Redmaw, which is why Sorla and Tristan's feud got extra personal for Rix. Roseleaf got in the crossfire. So basically, Rix is a Vool and used to be part of the Bronze Legion. 
Before he rebelled, he was already getting fed up with guilt and resentment for the Stonehall Empire he was fighting for, who were referring to his people as savages. But then, when Legion Commander decided to occupy Rosleaf, it was the last drop for Ix, and he spazzed out hard. He backstabbed Marcus, one of Treston's closest underlings, and started a full war within Rosleaf, trying to re the Bronze Legion out. Meanwhile, Sir Lacan and the Red Hiss Horde were sieging their way into Roseleaf, which is why Treston was occupying them in the first place. Sorla was trying to get to Stonehall, so Legion Commander wanted to ambush the Red Mist by meeting them in the Roseleaf Forest instead. But maybe she shouldn't have treated the Vuls so poorly, because the rebellion may be what ultimately led to her defeat, if my theory is correct. What I think ended up happening, and we don't know until a second expansion or Artifact 2.0, is that Legion Commander ended up shutting down the Vul Uprising, but then weakened by it, lost to Sorla. And then the continuation of the story is the battle moving from Roseleaf to Stonehall, maybe with a bunch of undead wolves added too. Because most people agree that it is Rix we see in the Oath, which means he made a deal with the demons of the Court of Bristol, and he is the reason why the dead are rising. Bristleback seems like a mix between hedgehog and boar, but he is actually a porcupine. His original design and Dota 1 model was based on boars, so I think they nailed it with a porcupine look. His story is quite simple, that he gets angry and likes to fight, so he got a job as an enforcer at a bar. He was incredibly strong and beat the change out of anyone who didn't want to pay up for their drink. But one day a particular tusked polar bear didn't want to pay his check, and after the fight it remained unpaid. Frizzleback had been bested in battle, and so he set out to train so maybe he could beat his new rival. Pangolier is a pangolin furry. His people are hunted by poachers for their hides, so it's likely that they are rare. He grew up as a noble and ended up joining the Nivan Galants, the same group of swordsmen that the Sator Duelist is part of. They like adventure, justice, honor, and romance. Pangolier is very flamboyant and extravagant, and likely based on a mix of the Three Musketeers and Zorro. Bounty Hunter and Phantom Lancer both have Asian references in their lore, design, and names of abilities, so I've placed them both in the Far East. On my map, the Wailing Mountains is basically China, while the Eastern Isles are basically Japan. Roughly something like that. It's the best I could do that makes the most sense. But what Bounty Hunter and PL also have in common is their feline properties. Bounty is likely a Sphinx Cat Furry, while Phantom Lancer is a Blue Lion Furry or something. PL grew up in a remote village in Pole, a kingdom where wars were Waged. He had no knowledge of it growing up though, as his people were concerned with fishing and living quiet, peaceful lives. But eventually the war reached them too, and so PL vowed with his lance to defend his home and people. He and his kin were placed in the vanguard against the Dread Magus Vorn, and he watched as every single one of his brothers perished next to him. But PL alone was able to get through the traps and enemies, and duel the evil magician. PL ended up winning, and as he gave the final blow, Vorn exploded into many light fragments. This gave PL his new power over illusions of himself that he could command at will. Bounty Hunter, on the other hand, has a much more debated and mysterious past. It is argued exactly how he did originate, but most stories agree that he was some sort of low-class orphan. He had a rough childhood and had to grow up quickly to learn how to survive a cruel and unforgiving world. Other tales people tell are of what frightening achievements he has made in adulthood. He has taken down many impossible bounties, like the Tyrant King Goth, the Thief White Cape, and Sorok the Hunter. No one is safe from Gondar if their bounty is high enough. One such bounty is on Mareska the Dark Willow, set by her own father. She got tired of the high-class life as a Revtel Merchant King's daughter, so she burned her father's estate down and escaped. Now Bounty Hunter has captured her, as we have seen in Artifact. But there might be hope for her. Meepo is some sort of rodent furry, whether they're a bunny, a rat, or whatever you want to call them. For me, it's rabbits, but I know some people insist they're a rat, so I'm gonna include it. In Dota 2, their lore is simply that they're geomancers digging around ruins, looking for crystals to sell. They have developed a pretty shady personality, after having to live a difficult life of big fish eat smaller fish. In Artifact, they have taken a large loan to pay off some debt that they can't pay, and so to avoid getting killed by a bunch of people who are pissed off, they have decided to save Dark Willow from Bounty Hunter. Their plan is that then she will owe them, and so she will save the day and solve their problems somehow. But first of all, could they beat Bounty? And second of all, if they did and free Dark Willow, how is she gonna help them? She's in just as much trouble as them, if not even more, and doesn't have her father's wealth. She is a capable thief though, so maybe she could steal something they could sell? I don't know. Either way, the Meepos are in some pretty deep shit. So that's all the furries. Sorry for the cringy term, I just couldn't think of a better one.
Oh, and by the way, you're welcome that I didn't use this opportunity to just not be in the video as my Ricky cosplay as an epic witty joke. You know there's always that one guy who just can't help himself and has to make the Ricky joke. Oh hey, it's nice to the two fan art painting, I especially like Ricky. Okay, I will admit I secretly find it funny, but I'm very ashamed of it because the joke has literally been repeated a billion times, so yeah. You're welcome. Thanks for watching and thank you for all the amazing comments you leave me. I cherish every single one and it's such a great motivator, so thank you. Peace.